Police find the body of a man lying in a ditch 60 feet from the wreckage of his car. Can a few pieces of plastic tell investigators what happened? I've got to fail to remain here, and I need to investigate this further. Then in Maryland, the driver of a pickup truck turns a holiday celebration into tragedy for a grieving family. I, I, get off. Surviving the wreck, he seems to simply vanish into thin air. He still has the potential to kill again. And in New Jersey, a young girl is killed crossing the street. Can her remains tell investigators who dealt the fatal blow? Every year, violent collisions kill 40,000 Americans and injure another 3 million. But there is no such thing as an accident. Every collision has a story, as unique as the people involved. Rusty Haight is a leading authority on accident reconstruction. He trains investigators around the world to read the clues and solve the mysteries. Accident investigation is one of the more challenging assignments in police work. There's not a lot of folks that'll stay with it for very long, and there's a good reason for that. These dedicated professionals can be in the middle of a family celebration, a holiday gathering, a, a birthday party, and the next thing you know, they're called out to handle a really messy situation on the highway. While the rest of us can stay with friends and family, these are the folks that have to go out there and pick up the pieces of a tragedy. On the drive home, Michael Richards and his wife Sandy are still reveling in the glow of a lavish company party thrown to celebrate the holidays and ring in the new year. Leaving the party late, they've left themselves only a few hours to prepare for the arrival of their daughter and two grandchildren early the next morning. But as they wind around a bend in the road, their attention shifts to a pair of headlights that blind their view. There is no time to react, and in a heartbeat, it's over. Rescue workers arriving just minutes later work frantically to free the couple from their car, knowing their lives hang in the balance. Barely clinging to life, Sandy and Michael are rushed to a nearby hospital. Rescuers then turn the scene over to Gary Lewis, an experienced investigator with one of Maryland's top collision reconstruction units. His job is to find out exactly what would cause such a devastating wreck on a road with a posted speed limit of just 30 miles per hour. When I arrived at the scene of this wreck, I found a pickup truck that was partially off the roadway. The front end was off into the woods. The back of the truck was still sitting in the westbound lane of the roadway. It was evident that the front bumper of the truck had uh, what we call overridden the front bumper of the car. In other words, it wasn't a bumper-to-bumper -bumper hit, but the bumper of the truck went over top of the bumper of the car. Therefore, a lot more damage was caused on the car. Both occupants had been transported from the scene, and the driver of the truck was nowhere to be found. An empty car at a crash scene fills investigators with dread. Virtually any impact a victim experiences when thrown from the vehicle can produce a fatal head or spinal injury. The way the rack happened, theoretically, somebody could have been ejected from that vehicle. So members of fire rescue personnel that arrived on the scene and police department personnel checked the surrounding area for several yards back into the woods to see if anybody had been ejected, and they came up with nothing. Gary Lewis can only assume that the driver of the pickup was able to walk away from the scene, but he is certain that the driver is injured, most likely suffering from shock. So when someone goes into a state of shock, their vital organs are starved of oxygen. They can confuse, disoriented. They can wander off. And in a worst case scenario, should they collapse, if aid isn't brought to them soon enough, they can die because they fail to get enough blood supply to all the internal organs of their body. Working crashes almost always means working under the worst conditions. Nighttime, damp, wet, snow, rain, you name it, these guys are out doing it at night. Tonight it's a little cold, it's a little bit wet, there's crashes spread out all over the road and into the forest. Um, we're out here in the middle of nowhere and we've got a missing driver. This guy could have walked off to get help, could have walked off disoriented, and in some injuries set in later, and he may not make it out of the forest. 
Trying to recreate a crash from bits of debris and wreckage is always a monumental challenge. Despite that fact, Lewis needs to use what evidence remains to find out exactly what happened. Given the extent of their injuries, Lewis knows he may never get the chance to ask the Richards what they saw. The wrecks already happened when we get there. So we have to deal with from crash to final rest. So we have the post-crash energy, and we need to, to use that into some type of formula that's going to tell us what came into that wreck. The car had been traveling westbound, was hit, and redirected back eastbound. And then knowing the weights, you can calculate what kind of energy it would take to redirect that car back in the other direction a certain distance. Based on that, I obtained an impact speed of the truck at a minimum of 46 miles an hour. Using detailed measurements and a survey of the damage, Lewis determines that the pickup truck was well over the speed limit of 30 miles per hour at impact. But evidence ripped into the asphalt has more to tell about the pickup's role in the crash. Well, Gary, you got night, the weather against you. What do you got in this one? This pickup truck was traveling down this direction. Apparently lost it on the curve. It came across the center of the road. Two vehicles Im impacted back here. We have gouge marks in the road, some scrape marks coming out to where this car ended up. And then the pickup truck rotates through the crash and ends up leaving these scrape marks to its position of final rest back here. It came over on the wrong side of the road on the curve, it looks like. Well, you got some to work with. Good luck to you. Gouges and scrape marks have clearly put the pickup truck in the wrong lane at the moment of impact, but that's only one factor in the crash. To determine if this was a criminal act, Lewis needs to know what would cause the driver to lose control. Why was there so much damage done to the Richards' car? And how was anyone able to walk away from a scene of such destruction? Coming up, police begin a desperate search for the missing driver of the pickup. And later, can two conflicting versions of a fatal crash both be wrong? A young girl's tragic death seems beyond explanation. A holiday celebration suddenly turns tragic for a middle-aged couple. Despite the heroic efforts of rescue workers to free them from their car and get them to the hospital, their work was in vain. Michael Richards is pronounced dead on arrival. His wife, Sandy, remains in critical condition. Inspector Gary Lewis has determined that their car actually went from traveling forward at 30 miles per hour to moving backwards in a fraction of a second. Unlike the driver of the pickup truck, the Richards experienced an almost instant change of direction that produced massive internal injuries. It's what police call a fatal Delta V. All right, Delta V, the change of velocity for a given crash, is really a way of rating the severity of any car crash. We know it takes place over a certain fixed period of time. What we're defining with the term Delta V, or change of speed, is how bad the magnitude of that change over that little period of time. And that really leads us to an understanding of injury. Uh, for example, a car that's moving forward at some speed and is stopped in the collision and driven backwards has not only an increased change of speed compared to one that simply stops at a crash, but also exposes the occupants to a greater potential for injury. Um, as the change of speed increases over a short period of time, folks get hurt and uh, worse and worse. In other words, it's not direct impact with metal or glass that does so much damage to the Richards' bodies, but rather an instantaneous change in direction. This sudden shift puts catastrophic force on the heart and other organs. Massive internal bleeding usually follows, and this leads directly to Michael Richards' death. But the driver of the pickup is not nearly as vulnerable. His higher mass and greater speed at the time of collision keep his truck moving forward. Still, a collision at that speed is almost certain to cause multiple injuries and shock. The driver's life is also in grave danger. With the search on in earnest, Lewis gets two crucial pieces of information. A witness reports seeing the driver flee from the scene just moments after the collision. Another call to police reports a confrontation with the driver himself. Hey, I'm Look, look, I got in a wreck, and I, I might have killed someone. Take my look, I, what? look, I gotta what? go. Look, get off. His name is Reggie Dowd, and he's not in good shape. The co-owner of the truck made a phone call to the police and reported that her boyfriend had come to her house, taken her car pretty much by force. He threatened her. I don't know. He was limping, though. 
I don't know, he just came in here, he was limping, he said he might have killed someone, he took my keys, and then he left. No. She also told the police that he was drunk, had been drinking, and that he was high and said he smoked crack cocaine. What we have is a person who's already been involved wreck in one wreck and killed somebody with a vehicle. Now he has another vehicle and he's back out on the road again. It's like a murderer walking away with a murder weapon. He still has the weapon. He's still in the same condition he was and he still has the potential to kill again. In a situation like this, it would really help to know the extent of the driver's injuries. Does he need medical attention? Will he be looking for painkillers? Can he mask his injuries when he goes to see a doctor? Let's see if we can't help out. Thanks to the girlfriend, we know the driver's hurt. The question is, how bad? Well, we have ways of sorting that out. A dummy with a little paint reveals what typically happens to someone in a head-on crash. The seat belts and airbags are gonna work together to protect the head and upper torso, but they do that at the expense of the lower extremities. Knees and ankles are still going to be tangled up in the underside of the dash and the steering column. Look at that ankle. An injury like that, when you make contact with the floorboard or the brake pedal, it's going to hurt. If this dummy could talk, he'd probably be asking for more than aspirin. As police continue to search for the injured Reggie Dowd, Gary Lewis returns to his office to examine each vehicle's SDM module. A vehicle's black box. It tells investigators how a car was driven up to five seconds before impact. From his analysis at the scene, Gary knows the pickup was speeding at the time of the crash. He hopes the SDM will explain how it ended up in the wrong lane, taking the life of Michael Richards. We see that this vehicle was operated at 50 at impact, but five seconds prior to that was going 71 miles an hour and the driver was actually on the brakes for the entire five seconds prior to the crash occurring. The visibility wasn't five seconds down the road on this particular stretch of road. It happened around a curve. So he wasn't reacting to the other car. He was hitting the brakes to save himself. This driver's operating recklessly without any regard for anybody else's safety or his own when he's at far the speed limit on that type of roadway. This is a critical finding for Gary. It concludes that the driver's actions were criminal and the data can be used as evidence in court. The local hospital on the lookout for suspicious leg injuries notifies police that Reggie Dowd has shown up in the emergency room. Unable to endure the searing pain in his ankle, he finally comes out of hiding to seek some relief. We had information he was going to show up at the hospital, and I met him there. His left leg was extremely swollen. The ankle and the knee were, were really swollen from injuries he got in this wreck. Could you reveal your shoe, please? His moods were just completely all over the board. He'd go from sad to almost crying to angry, ready to fight. Reggie, you remember what happened? He said that he'd been involved in the wreck, said he was driving his truck, but knew nothing else about it. Didn't remember anything else about this wreck, but admitted driving. And then decided he didn't want to say anything, and then the mood would go back to angry again. He, he didn't want to talk at all. Then he would almost say that he was sorry and you'd see the tears about to start, but they never came. Gary's in a tough spot here. He's got good physical evidence to work from. He has information from Reggie's girlfriend that suggests Reggie's condition's impaired, but she doesn't see him driving at the time of the crash. He's got injuries on Reggie. Reggie's injuries are consistent with the, with the crash itself and the crash dynamics. But he needs something more, so we have driving dynamics. We have uh, the data from the reconstruction and the data recorder, and that tells us more about the crash. 
can relate that to the injuries, but he's looking for that one last bit of evidence to tie Reggie back to this car and this crash. Suspicion's not enough. He's going to need something more. One of the first things I thought was fingerprints. And then I realized, well, if it is his car, his fingerprints are everywhere. And I thought, DNA, because it's the latest, greatest thing, even more definitive than fingerprints. So I thought, perfect, I'll, I'll get DNA. And then I realized, well, again, being his car, his DNA is everywhere. And then it hit me, except for one thing or one place. And that is something that only comes out and only exposes itself in a violent wreck. The airbags of the vehicle. That airbag explodes right in front of your face. Your DNA is going to be deposited on it when you hit it, whether you want it to or not. Yours and nobody else's unless there's two people in the car and they both happen to hit that bag. That was my best shot. I got a search warrant and seized that airbag and eventually got a match with the suspect's DNA. With all of the information finally in hand, Gary can now give a full account of what happened on a dark December night in rural Maryland. Reggie Dowd was driving his pickup truck at over 60 miles an hour on a rain-slicked country road. Losing control on a corner, he applies his brakes and drifts into oncoming traffic, colliding with a car being driven by Sandy Richards. She and her husband suffer massive internal injuries when their car is instantly stopped by the impact and then hurtled backwards. Michael Richards is pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. But his wife, Sandy, miraculously survives and eventually makes a full recovery. Despite Reggie Dowd's efforts to flee the scene and deny any involvement in the wreck, Gary Lewis was able to establish that Dowd was speeding at the time of impact, that he was in the wrong lane, and that he was ultimately the cause of the crash. Dowd eludes charges of driving while intoxicated, but indisputable DNA evidence leaves him little choice but to plead guilty to manslaughter by automobile and hit and run. For Gary, this all came together as an application of technology. He used his at-scene work to figure out how fast the cars were going and how the people inside the cars moved. Then he used more technology. He used the DNA to figure out who was actually behind the wheel. And lastly, to get a picture of how this, all, this crash all came together, he used some information from the airbag control module that captured some pre-crash information. All of those together gave him an incredibly complete picture of this particular crash and led to 12 years for the driver. Coming up, a morning commute ends in tragedy for a father of three. Investigators on the scene struggle to explain what suddenly set his car spinning out of control. And next, after a young girl is struck and killed while crossing the street, two drivers deny any responsibility. And her remains offer clues that tell investigators what happened. For a driver, seeing a pedestrian or seeing something in the road is not about visibility, it's about what's called conspicuity. Something has to stand out against the background in front of you. A lot of times, what that is is movement. You don't necessarily see the pedestrian at first. What you see is movement ahead of you. When you see movement, you can react to it. You know, there's a lot of complications at night. One of those complications is oncoming headlights. It's amazing how much they can actually block. Accountant Benjamin Davis is coming back from an office happy hour. He's worried because the gossip was all about company downsizing. It's a real distraction, and these SUV headlights coming at him don't help. Half a mile down the road on the side of the street, Miranda Smith is in a hurry to get back home after a tough 10-hour shift at work. She's almost there. She just has to cross the street and the vacant lot behind it. But fate has other deadlier plans. <laughs> When Detective Andy Rich arrives at the crash site, Miranda's body is in the middle of the road. She's pronounced dead at the scene. There's only one thing he can do for her now, and that's to discover the exact circumstances that ended her life at just 18. My main focus as a detective for the prosecutor's office is to determine if a crime has occurred. First thing I did was go to the police officers who were already on the scene just to get a basic feeling for what was going on. Okay, what happened? The police officers tell him that it may be a hit and run. The victim certainly seems to have been struck by more than one vehicle. 
three witnesses claim the first vehicle to hit Miranda Smith was a van which then took off in a hurry. The driver of the SUV following the van claims the body came out of nowhere and fell onto his front hood after being struck. And there's another driver in the mix who says he had to steer his car around the body when it ended up in the opposing lane. Both drivers stopped while the van fled. There are a few versions of what happened, but there's only ever one version of the truth. Accident investigators run into some complex and interesting cases, and this is one of them. So Andy's gonna have to look at the physical evidence from the roadway, from the vehicle, from the bodies, and sort out what really happened using the objective information that doesn't have an interest in the case. Moreover, if it's a hit and run, time's working against him and he's gotta work fast. It was described as a uh, van. You guys put an alert on it? Yes, we did. We already have an alert put out on it. The search is on for the missing van. But at the scene, Andy Rich is concentrating on what the evidence can tell him. For all accident investigators, there is a simple rule of thumb. Anytime two objects come in contact with each other, there's going to be a transfer of evidence. However, not in all cases are we going to find that physical evidence. In this case, we were lucky. There was a lot of physical evidence. First, Andy has to determine whether or not the woman was hit in the first place, and if so, by which car and in what order. My next step would be to go see the body and determine what type of injuries, at least on the outside, that I could see. See if they're consistent with motor vehicles. If this woman was hit by a car, how many different types of injuries am I going to see? For example, uh, sliding along the ground, head contacts from windshields. And this way, I can match up. For example, if I see glass in, the, in her hair, I want to see which vehicle has a fractured windshield. Over the years, crash tests like this one help us better understand what happens when a pedestrian is hit by a car. Applying crash test data is the job of biomechanics experts like Judd Welcher. So Judd, what kind of injuries would you expect to see from a pedestrian hit by a car? As you can see by the alignment of the bumper to your knee, the most common area of injury is down into the lower extremities. With the lower leg, you see damage to the knee structures. And as you get up to higher bumpers or shorter individual damage into the thigh, the femur area. As the severity increases, the body will begin to hit further up onto the vehicle. You'll begin to get head contacts up into the hood structures. You get severe injuries as you get further up into the windshield area. Andy Rich sees signs of injuries just like those, but he doesn't yet know which vehicle hit her or how many times she was struck. His findings here will be critical as they could lead to jail time for one or both of these drivers. Andy's first move is to talk to the driver of the car. So you want to go back to your car, meet the officer over there? Benjamin Davis says he didn't see the teenager getting hit by any other vehicle. Come with me. He says the body just appeared in the middle of his lane and he barely missed I, it by swerving hard. I swear, I mean, she like jumped out at me. I barely missed her. I, I was just going, I, I was listening. The driver of the car I told that they didn't happened. hit the woman at all. Rich needs to check out Davis's story. First, he takes another look at the body to see if it can offer up additional clues, and it does. He finds a colored smudge on the woman's sneaker that looks very similar to the color of Davis's car. His next stop is the car's rear end. When I looked at the car, I found what I believed to be blood stains in front of the rear wheel. I also found bloody tire prints, four of them, led from the body to where the car parked. It appeared just on, on its face that this vehicle had contact with the body. But just to make sure, I measured the distance between each tire print and calculated what the radius of the tire would be that left. It looked like that tire from the car made those four prints. Also, the tire treads, the pattern, appeared to be consistent with what we saw on the roadway. A good accident investigator has to cover all the bases. Even though some red substance may look like blood, Andy's got to be sure. So he's going to run what's called a Castle Meyer test on the roadway and the bumper of the car. 
To do a castle Meyer test, you have to mix together two basic chemicals, phenyl saline and hydrogen peroxide. You get a wet swab, you get it wet with distilled water, and rub it over your suspect stain. Put the chemicals in contact with that swab, and if it turns pink, you have a positive test, meaning that it's actually blood. The test proves positive. It is blood. It's clear now that Benjamin Davis did not tell the truth. I just tested your uh, car. It's got her blood on it. You have something you want to tell me? I pretty much just approached him and told him, I know you're lying, that we had tire prints leading from the body to his car, and that we tested the surface of his car and it tested positive for blood. So we knew that his vehicle came into contact with the body, at which point the driver admitted that the body bounced into his car. The body landed on my hood. Okay. Um... While Davis is changing his story to Andy Rich, the driver of the SUV is telling a police officer his version of what happened. Uh, where, where, what the happened body with... fell on my hood. Uh -huh. The van hit her. His story was he was just driving along, going westbound, when the body dropped in on him out of thin air. And his story was that another car had hit him first projected the body up into the air, and then it landed on his car. Any news about that van? But there's still no sign of any missing van. In fact, there's no evidence at the scene that there ever was a van at all, only the statements of witnesses who say they saw one. We were unable to find any parts from another vehicle. I started doubting then that there was actually another vehicle. If it turns out there was no van, it's either the car or the SUV that hit the teenager first. Rich is still trying to figure that out. But more than that, he's working on the how and why she was hit in the first place. Coming up, a little piece of fabric turns Andy Rich's investigation 180 degrees. And later, can headlight fragments explain why a car mysteriously tumbled out of control? The life of a bright 18-year-old named Miranda Smith has come to a tragic and sudden end on a busy roadway. Oh my God, no, no! She was hit by at least two vehicles, a car and an SUV. Each driver is pointing the finger of guilt at a mysterious van that fled the scene after hitting the girl. Accident investigator Andy Rich is starting to piece this story together, and he's pretty sure there was no van involved. He knows the driver of the car is a proven liar. Now what he wants to do is figure out if the driver of the SUV has a better grip on the truth. Robert Johnson says he was simply driving home in his SUV after a visit to a friend's apartment. He claims he was behind a van when, out of the blue, a body landed on the hood of his SUV. He stopped and saw the van zoom away. Rich turns to examine the SUV. Soon enough, he finds a mark made by the young victim's clothes. But it's not on the hood of the SUV. It's somewhere much more telling. And I found fiber weave impressions on the bumper. It's a pattern left on a car, normally in the surface of the paint. There's no mistaking it for coming, being produced by a set of blue jeans. When we look at the angle that the fabric weave impressions were, and it was consistent with somebody standing. That means for the van to have hit Miranda Smith first, she would have had to land on her feet in front of the SUV before getting hit again. An almost impossible scenario. After five hours of investigation, Rich is now almost certain there was never a van and that the SUV hit the young woman first, but he needs more proof. The next major piece of the puzzle will come with the results of Miranda Smith's autopsy. So Andy wastes no time getting down to the morgue for a consultation with medical examiner, Dr. Marianne Clayton. Hi, Doc. Hi, Andy. I need to figure out whether she was standing when she was hit. Well, I would say so. Uh, she's got the typical uh, upright pedestrian group of injuries. First off, she's got a lethal head injury, impact left forehead, pretty extensive skull fracture pattern under that. And she's got your classic bumper fracture, the left lower leg. How high is that fracture? Uh, 
17 inches. Okay, that's exactly the height of the guy's bumper. Great, good correlation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Prosecutor's office. Dr. Clayton's report confirms Andy's working theory. The lethal head wound is consistent with a windshield strike to a standing pedestrian. Likewise, the broken fibula bone shows that Miranda's legs were virtually cut out from under her by a fast-moving vehicle, exactly the same height as Robert Johnson's SUV. After his visit to the medical examiner's office, Andy had the SUV towed to this garage. He wants to eliminate the hit-and-run scenario once and for all. Evidence from the fiber weave on the bumper and injuries to her body show that Miranda Smith was hit by the SUV while she was standing. Now he'll examine the blood spatter on the SUV. That may turn out to be the most revealing evidence of all. If we look up in here at these blood stains, you see that they all have uh, directionality. It's a blood drop that has a tail to it. And if we look at all of these tails and we trace the directionality of each of these blood stains, we'll see that they all converge at this windshield wiper spindle here. And you can see where the hair is deposited. This tells me that the woman's head had come into contact with this windshield wiper spindle. And then the blood, the blood sprayed up in this direction, causing these stains. What we don't see is any indications that the body could have just dropped in from the sky, for example, getting hit by a vehicle first and then falling in. If that were the case, we would see a nice circular drop of blood without any of the tails. Since that's not here, uh, we could pretty much eliminate that this body just dropped in. The witnesses say there was a van, but the physical evidence proves without a doubt that this was simply not the case. In a serious accident like this, the witness is first getting very much bombarded with emotions. Their emotions are heightening. As a byproduct of that, their perceptions are decreasing because it is a different part of your brain that incorporates emotions than what incorporates thought processes. So as your emotions heighten, your thought processes actually become disorganized. The circumstances surrounding Amanda Smith's death are now clear to Andy Rich. First, she was struck by Robert Johnson's SUV, a collision that whipped Miranda's legs out from under her and flung her head first into the windshield. The body was then thrown into the opposite lane, where it was hit by Benjamin Davis's car. But there is still something bothering Andy. He needs to know why Robert Johnson didn't see the woman. After all, she was in the middle of the road and there's no indication of swerving or braking. This is a key question, because it could determine whether Johnson's actions were reckless and if criminal charges should be filed. My main focus as a detective for the prosecutor's office is to determine if a crime has occurred. I asked him if he had his headlights on, if they were working, and he said they were on and working. But that's not enough. We need to go to the physical evidence to see what the real truth is. Hey, Andy, what do you got? I'm looking at these light bulbs here. I want to see if this guy had his headlights on or not at the time of uh, the crash. So this is the marker light. There's a light on the side of the car. And I'm looking at the filament here. It looks like we got some hot shock. This one is stretched out, so this is telling me that this light was on at the time of the collision. So let's go a step further and look at the headlight. OK, this is unexpected here. We're looking at some cold break here. So that suggests this one was off. Right, this, light, this headlight was off, but yet we had a marker light on. Normally, you're both gonna have them both on or off. So we've got one light on and one light off. Right. Even though the driver told Rich that the SUV's headlights were fully on, the evidence says otherwise. Next, the investigator needs to determine if it was a case of driver error or if there was a problem with the electrical circuit. This van, had in the automotive industry what they call a multifunction switch. Now, when you rotate this switch one click, it turns the parking lights on. When you rotate it a second click, it puts on the headlights. So what must have happened in this case, since the circuits were working properly, is the driver only put the parking lights on. He only turned that multifunction switch one click. After seven hours, Andy Rich has established exactly how Miranda Smith was hit and killed. 
Andy Rich concludes that Robert Johnson didn't see the young woman until it was too late for two specific reasons. One, the headlights of his SUV were not on. Two, he was blinded by the oncoming headlights of Benjamin Davis's car. In the end, no criminal charges were actually filed. Both drivers tried to get themselves out of any potential blame by making up parts of their stories. While that may not be a crime, it's not exactly honest either. And it made Andy Rich's job a lot more difficult. There are a number of reasons for pedestrian crashes. On the pedestrian side, wearing dark clothing and entering where there's not enough light or where a driver wouldn't expect you is not a good idea. On the driver's side, there's distractions, there's oncoming headlights, a number of different reasons a driver may not readily see the pedestrian entering the road. One last thing that driver can do, though, is make sure the lights are turned on all the way. But for the turn of a switch, this pedestrian would still be alive. Next, investigators trying to solve a single vehicle crash that killed a father of three make a startling discovery at the scene, one that dramatically alters the course of their investigation. Sharp steering maneuver right and left at low speed, not a big deal, you can recover from it. At high speeds, with a buildup of lateral friction, that might be a little tougher to deal with. In Toronto, we have a single vehicle rollover that looks like it came from such a maneuver, some sort of steering input. Investigators there are trying to figure out why. A 911 call leads police to an overturned car on a busy Ontario freeway. The first officer on the scene confirms the worst. The driver has been ejected. His body, crushed after being torn from the vehicle during the crash, lies over 60 feet away from what remains of his car. The police soon confirm the identity of the victim. His name is Paul Taylor, a local father of three who left home early this morning, hoping to avoid any heavy traffic heading into the city. Brad Muir is a senior reconstructionist with the Ontario Provincial Police. He leads a team of investigators who respond to fatal crashes on some of the area's most heavily traveled expressways. Their job is to solve a mystery. Why did this car suddenly roll over? And who or what was at fault? A single vehicle crash is the most difficult scenario they face. They offer few clues to help investigators determine what went wrong. When I first came on scene, I was confronted with this vehicle that was rolled over on its roof, partly on the roadway, partly on the shoulder. And it was obvious to me that he had rolled over. And, you know, I, I saw that because as I was walking down the asphalt, there was uh, an area of scraping where the vehicle was on its roof and some paint transferred onto the road, broken glass from one of the windows that, that shattered upon impact when he rolled over. And, you know, I had to look at this vehicle, and there's no obvious cause on the roadway of why this vehicle rolled over. Um, I had to you know, get down and have a closer look at the vehicle for any damage or something that might have caused him to wind up where he did. Brad and his team have just showed up on a rollover crash. You've got somebody ejected, they're dead. And the problem with that is you can survive rollover crashes with a simple fix. That would be seatbelts. Seatbelts keep you in the car, the car protects you in the rollover. That's an easy fix. Unfortunately, folks don't take advantage of that, and in rollovers, they get killed. Now, these guys have got an interesting crash. They've got a very limited amount of evidence to work with, one vehicle on scene. We don't know if the guy was asleep at the wheel, was run off the road. What, what happened, they're going to have to sort out, and they'll do it with what little they have to work with right now. Rollovers are extremely violent events. If this one was caused by a mechanical failure, it would be an easy thing to spot, but nothing stands out. Instead, it appears as if this car just suddenly became airborne at 50 miles per hour and began tumbling down the road. A survey of the wreck offers little to investigators until Brad Muir discovers an odd stain on the back bumper. Well, looking at the back bumper of the vehicle, I, I noticed there is a, a paint transfer and some paint chips on the back of the bumper. Now, 
you know, a vehicle of that age, and of course in a city, it's not always the smoking gun. Um, you know, there's a lot of cars just walking through any parking lot. You'll see scuffs and scrapes on their bumpers. It's a matter of trying, if you can, to isolate what would constitute fresh damage or fresh transfer versus something that's been there for a while. It can be very difficult sometimes, depending on the age of the vehicle. Fresh damage would suggest that another car was involved in this crash. Paint can be transferred from one car to another on impact, but only further tests back at the lab can confirm this suspicion. Given the extent of the damage, Brad concludes that the vehicle was moving at high speed, and therefore it took several seconds to come to a stop. Whatever caused the driver to lose control took place at least a thousand feet up the road. So you got a pretty good crash scene here. What have you got? Well, I've worked about a thousand feet back up the road and I have a a lot of nothing at the moment, just some evidence from this car uh, where it rolled over and some scrapings off the back bumper. Everything else is pretty much gathered in this scene here and that's all from this car. So far in here, it's all from this car. I have nothing that indicates to me another vehicle was involved. After an exhaustive survey of the crash scene, Muir opts to search for more evidence further down the road beyond the original point of impact. And what he discovers dramatically alters the course of the investigation. When I walk down the road and I start to see, you know, a puddle of, of antifreeze or engine coolant on the roadway, you know, that could just be a rad hose letting go. But then when you couple that with some, some broken car parts in the same area right adjacent to it, it's, it's not any one of those things by itself. But when you couple all those three things together, you know, now I'm on the right trail. Now I'm, I'm pretty much, I've got to fail to remain here and I need to investigate this further and see if I can identify that other vehicle that's no longer in my scene. Brad Muir's team has solved one mystery but are now faced with another. Evidence gathered at the scene tells them a car that rolled over and ejected its driver was actually struck by another car. Investigators now realize they are in a race against time to find a driver who has caused one fatality and may still be behind the wheel. They may only have a matter of hours before this driver disappears into a sea of commuters and is lost to them forever. Coming up, can a few specks of paint and a broken headlight bring a hit and run driver to justice? Yeah. No, I'm on my way there now. Paul Taylor, a 36-year-old okay. advertising writer, is cruising along in the early morning hours, hoping to avoid rush hour traffic into the city. Instead, the father of three finds himself in a terrifying rollover that starts when he is bumped by another car. Evidence found at the roadside tells police the other car may have stopped briefly before fleeing the scene. 20% of all accidents are hit and runs, and it usually means a driver has been in trouble before. But the shock and stress of being involved in a crash can have profound effects on even the most responsible driver. Is it possible to make poor judgment during a panic attack? Is The question is a good one, because research shows us that when we're in panic or in a heightened state of anxiety, our emotional response bypasses our thinking brain. We have a very old and primitive part of our brain called the limbic system that responds to fear. And that part of your brain is designed for survival. It's not designed to make good decisions or do any problem solving in difficult situations, which is why people often say they can't think clearly when they're in a panic situation. Basically, at that moment, it's as if your mind is saying to your body, you're in danger, get out of here, and get out of here quick. Brad Muir returns to his office with a few specks of black paint, a few drops of antifreeze, and some pieces of plastic. It might not sound like much, but to an investigator, it's almost as good as a footprint. Well, I've got a gray piece of, of a headlight. It's the backing to a reflector lens for a headlight. And it's got what appears to be a, a part number for a General Motors vehicle. It's got the prefix GM, which indicates to me General Motors. R for right, so I know it's a right-hand headlight. And it's got a, a, what looks to be an eight-digit part number on here, which I should be able to uh, nail down to a, a particular line of General Motors vehicles. It's a lucky break. And within a few minutes, Brad Muir knows exactly what type of GM car initiated the deadly rollover crash that killed Paul Taylor. 
If you think about what Brad and his team have been able to accomplish in such a short period of time, it's pretty amazing. That's what good accident investigators do. They've taken the evidence from the scene and from that been able to sort out not only the make and model of the car, but also its color. Now they're going to turn to us for help. Brad's given the details of the investigation to the media. They're going to flood the airwaves with this information, and by the end of the afternoon, instead of just a couple hundred police cars looking for the driver, we'll have a couple million pairs of eyes peeled. Taking no chances that this car might slip off the radar, investigators also put the word out to repair shops and dealerships in the area to report any driver seeking repairs to a damaged radiator and a right front headlight. Check, check underneath. There's some, some sort of green stuff leaking. Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Great, here you go. Thanks. Less than 24 hours after arriving on the scene of a fatal rollover, Brad Muir is called to a garage that suspects they may have the car that initiated the crash. Margaret Doerr's vehicle undergoes a quick inspection in the garage. The telltale signs of damage Muir had anticipated are enough to secure a warrant to seize the car and to examine its SDM module, or black box recorder. I downloaded the airbag control module known as the SDM, or sensing diagnostic module for this vehicle. Uh, it had a, a, a bit of an event data recorder portion where it recorded some information for the bullet car, or the striking vehicle. And that really helped me because it showed that the driver of that car, or that car underwent a change of speed of about seven miles per hour over about a tenth of a second. Uh, seven miles per hour doesn't sound like a lot, but in, over that little time period, it was certainly a significant impact for the driver of that vehicle. And, and it really settled in my mind that she had to know that she had hit somebody because, you know, seven miles per hour in a tenth of a second, uh, that's a significant bump for her. With the final piece of the puzzle in place, Rusty and Brad can now replay the fatal chain of events. For Paul Taylor, it should have been another routine commute into the city. Arriving early into work allowed him free time in the afternoons to help coach his eldest son's soccer team. But shortly after he enters the freeway, a car driven by Margaret Dorr comes up from behind fast. It makes contact with Taylor's rear bumper while attempting to pass. The impact immediately causes his rear wheels to lose contact with the ground, sending him spinning to the right. When his wheels touch back down, they dig into the asphalt and hurl the car onto its side, sending it rolling thousands of feet past the point of impact. Unfortunately, Paul Taylor is not wearing a seatbelt. In an instant, he is launched out through the driver's side window and into the ditch. He dies from severe trauma to the head and massive internal bleeding. Margaret Dorr, on the way into the city to take her final college exams, flees the scene. But Brad Muir discovers crucial roadway evidence and builds a dragnet that eventually lands her in court. Margaret Dorr's clean driving record helps convince a judge that her poor judgment was not malicious. Instead of the five-year maximum penalty, she is handed a 90-day sentence and her license is suspended for one year. The fact that investigators were forced to track her down after the crash still baffles Brad Muir. For some reason, she just decided to fail to remain and, and, and took off and essentially turned what might have been a, a minor infraction, Highway Traffic Act regulatory violation into this criminal fail to remain. I, I, I just, uh, I struggle at times trying to understand the human nature side of what motivates people to, to just take off and leave somebody else in the ditch like that. There are a couple of things we take away from this crash. First, it has to do with closing speed. A car overtaking another one in a parking lot at a low speed, let's say 10 miles an hour, doesn't leave much of a post-impact scene. The crash scene's relatively compact. Now change that out into the highway where you have 60 overtaking 50, and you have to bring those cars to a stop at some point, have a lot bigger crash scene after the actual car-to-car -car impact, and a lot of times that can have disastrous results. The other thing we take away from this crash has to do with good investigative technique and a little bit of forensic evidence. Here, Brad did a great job taking little bits and pieces from the cars and brought it all together to solve a hit and run in a relatively short period of time.